Welcome to Talking Ball Sports, the 2020 NFL Draft pre-show coming to you from our homes right now because the COVID-19 pandemic has got us all in stay-at-home situations. So uh, joining me now, Charles Arbuckle, former UCLA tight end, Indianapolis Colts, New Orleans Saints, former ESPN analyst, still uh, working as an analyst in other places as well. Also, A.K. Magula joins us, former Gator, worked with the uh, AAF with the Arizona Hotshots, Chicago Bears, and Miami Dolphins as well. And myself, Reginald Walker, former Penn State Indy Lion, uh, joining you here uh, to talk a little NFL draft. And, and guys, we all, uh, first of all, thanks for, for joining us. And, and we all have been locked into college football and, and pro football, really, for much of our lives. And this time of year, I call this talking season. There's a lot of rumors, a lot of innuendo, a lot of things going on um, about different football teams and what they're going to do in the NFL draft. All of a sudden, now they want to tell you a guy's arm isn't as strong as they said it was for 15 weeks during the college football season, <laughs> whatever the case may be, right, guys? So uh, before we get into that, uh, first and foremost, um, how y'all doing, number one? Uh, we'll start with you, AK, since you're the special guest. Uh, how you doing in general right now? And then... Uh, what's kind of your mindset going into uh, what's going to be a very different look to the 2020 NFL draft? So right now I'm just hanging out in Atlanta, just trying to take care of my parents, just spend some time with them. And uh, I mean, going forward, I mean, this is a weird situation. Everyone's at home. No one's linking up. I mean, medical staff, like, you know, Dolphins are trying to get stuff on Tua still and they evaluated him before and now they're just sitting here and, I mean, it's an ongoing discussion day in and day out. And, I mean, it's making life difficult on everyone. But I think by the time the draft starts, everyone's going to have their plan. And we're going to see a fluctuation. I mean, I feel like it's going to be more safer picks going forward than having risk, guys. I think the biggest issue you have is that the medical folks can't get to these players like they want to. So whatever they have and whatever they've been able to – Ascertain whether it's the combine. Or a few, there were a few pro days, not many visits that happened because so many things happen with this right before that usually takes place. They're doing a lot of this. I mean, they're on uh, Skype and Zoom and all the different methods of, of getting together with folks to try to understand what those draft picks will be. So it's much different than what we've seen in the past, and I think that's what's going to make this draft so interesting. Roger Goodell is in his basement doing the draft. So I mean, <laughs> that just goes to show you that we've never had anything like this where you don't have guys that are in the facility uh, and, and really spend some time. So it'll be interesting. Let, let me ask you guys this before we really get into the crux of what's going on with this year's draft. Going forward, do you think, and it's something that just, this literally just popped in my head, Charles, as you were talking. Do we think that this may create a situation to where uh, some players and some schools try to maybe move up their pro days a little bit sooner, A, closer to the end of their college football season, right? And B, just to make sure if there are any issues in the future, they've gotten their pro days in so these kids can work out in front of uh, scouts. I think there's only a certain number of guys that go to the combine. And right. So it, this really hurts, and I think we talked about it and you kind of see what the scouts are doing. You, you've done the work. And you should know these players pretty well, but it's always something about that after the season, the pro, uh, the you know, all of the, the, the all-star games that take place, the combine, all of that little stuff seems to help solidify your choices. And think about Jalen Hurts. I mean, he's a good example, a guy that played well at the senior bowl, played well, you know, performed well at the combine. And I think he was one of the few that did have a, a senior day or a pro, pro day out at, at yeah. the so when you look at that, it's something about that extra piece that helps scouts and for whatever reason say, I'm going to solidify this guy. This guy becomes my guy, even though he's put four years or however many years he's played in college on tape. Um, and it could be one of those situations where we'll be a little bit fluid and we'll push this. The only problem this year is if there's any pushback to the season due to when we start a college football season, when that starts, that's going to – 
kind of really depend on when they could do an earlier pro day or do the days right after the combine to get those guys. So really what you want is you want to go to the combine and then have another four or five weeks before you have to perform again or somewhere in there. You don't want to go too far, but you don't want to go too short. And I think that's some of the things that some of these guys look for. Absolutely. Now let's, let's get into the, to the draft itself and, and, and the crux of why we're here. And I, look, you can, you know, you and I, Buck, have, have had this conversation a million times and AK, I'm sure you've probably heard it. This is the time of year and, and early in mini camp. And all, all these guys are t-shirt all Americans. They're t-shirt all pros. Until you put the pads on, it doesn't mean much. So the reality is, I think when, you know, for a lot of these these coaches and, and GMs and scouting departments, Buck, to your point, they're going to lean on that film because that's when you really see what a guy is anyway, when there's a chance for him to get smacked in the mouth. I, I used to make the joke all the time as a DB, you know, early, and you know this, Buck, being a tight end, early in, in camp, before you put the pads on, every corner blitz or every outside linebacker blitz, they swear they got the sack. But then the first two days with pads on, nobody gets to the quarterback anymore. It's amazing yeah. how that works. Um, so, you know, anyway, uh, speaking of quarterbacks, obviously right now the discussion is about Joe Burrow and the magnificent year. And I want to make a point about the year Joe Burrow had 60-plus touchdowns. It's so funny because we think back a few years ago, right? You go back all the way to Tim Tebow. He had 50 total touchdowns, lost nine, uh, lost three regular season games, and won the Heisman because that was such a feat. Colt Brennan throws 50 touchdowns at Hawaii, right, and gets invited, and everybody says, well, he did as much, he did as well as he could do. Jalen Hurts puts up 50, 50 touchdowns this year, and he's not in the mix. You know, all of a sudden, Joe Burrow puts up 60 touchdowns and has this ridiculous year with these crazy numbers, and he's at the top of everybody's draft board. And, and so you look at this, and, and right now the Cincinnati Bengals are on the clock with the number one pick. It seems like a no-brainer to go Joe Burrow, but there seems to be some momentum for Tua Tungavailoa lately uh, because a lot of his medicals have come back. And from what I've seen and what people have said, uh, it looks like, you know, even though this is the type of injury that's derailed a lot of careers, it seems as if all of the things that were issues for those guys post-injury are not really as big of issues for Tua with the hip in terms of circulation and blood flow and those types of things. Is that an indication that there is even really a discussion with Joe Burrow at the top or is Cincinnati clear far and away going Joe Burrow with the number one pick? So I feel like uh, they're just doing their due diligence right now on each guy, just trying to get everything you know figured out and just kind of piece all the puzzles together. But I mean, we were making the discussion the other day, if, if he never got hurt, the discussion would be for him and Joe Burrow right now as the number one overall pick with the right. work that Tua's put in. But Tua just kept getting hurt, and now all of a sudden it's just, let's just bump him down. That is it. If he didn't, it would be the discussion in the media right now would be, is it a one-year wonder for Joe Burrow? Or right. like the body of mass that Tua has put in over the time and has came in and won that in his first year. And – I just think that's the discussion right now to be had. And, like, people are just knocking out Tua because of the injury. But overall, I mean, just watching these two guys play, I feel like there's these two guys and then good separation. Before. Yes. But the thing that got me and, you know, a lot of people, when they interviewed Joe, and I was really eager to see how well he would respond to these questions. Last year, when he came to LSU and didn't put up those astronomical numbers, not only was he running a system, but he got there so late. He was yep. going with the freshmen. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you hear guys talk about this all the time. It normally takes them time to acclimate no matter where you go. Mm -hmm. so, Joe, as a fifth-year senior, was able to do his classes from the facility. Joe Burrow never left the building. Yeah. Joe Burrow is an ultimate leader that not only did that, but Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, guys like that, and yeah. they out in the summer and caught 10,000 balls. Those put in work together yeah. and understood and built that chemistry that they weren't able to build the year prior. I mean, just tossing Joe Burrow and say, okay, go out there and play, and they're running the <laughs> system. And, he, I mean, he managed. 
That's all yeah. he can do. But this year, coming from Ohio State in the yeah. offense, and now putting him in this offense with Joe Brady in that vertical pass and spread offense, he looks so natural. And the thing that gets me is one of the first couple games, this guy sees pressure coming. That's the best way to tell a quarterback. Is this guy getting duck under pressure? This guy literally stands there and throwing emers. <laughs> Yeah. Face of pressure and heist it against Texas on a third, yeah. third and 19 to Justin Jefferson over the middle. And I mean, with the way the NFL is going and moving their quarterbacks out, especially when you look at the Bengals and that line that they have, I mean, with Joe's ability to move and Zach Taylor's ability to move out their quarterbacks like they did with Tannehill, I mean, yeah, it seems like that that's the way they're going to go is going to be Joe. So every. every- Everything you just said, I like, but it's one. You said there's only two guys and then everybody else. I disagree with you because I think Justin Herbert fits right into that category. Mm. He may not be ahead of Tua, but I think he's right there because I think we don't give him enough credit for what he's been able to do over the course of time. He had no receivers at, at Zero. Until he got really pitman. limited at the uh, – and, and watching him develop and grow as a quarterback, but also – a guy like Ryan Tannehill, to me, helps Justin Herbert because Herbert is more – just as athletic. I'm not going to say more. Ryan Tannehill was a receiver, played yeah. like H-back, and played quarterback in college. So I, I, I get it. He's very athletic. Is he a great passer? Not always, but in an offense like that, he's good. Joe, Justin Herbert has some athletic ability. Justin Herbert's biggest problem was – how do you lead? You can't be a quiet, shy guy from Eugene, Oregon. You got to be a dog, and I think we right. saw that this year. That's why I'm in that that one, two, three category. Not ahead of Tua, but maybe ahead of Tua because lack of injuries that Herbert has. Hell. But clearly, I think Joe Burrow. Stuff, and I agree with you, AK. The thing that they did there to get we've talked about LSU for years having receivers, having defensive backs, having a lot of dogs but they finally got somebody at the quarterback position that can make plays. And that's why we saw them have such a magical season with all that offensive firepower. And I think Buck to add to that about Joe Burrow and I, and I'll be honest, it, it, it took me a while to get up fully on the Joe Burrow bandwagon. I'll be completely honest about that. And people can yell at me for that if they want to, but it's the truth. Uh, but one of the things that, that I, I learned to really appreciate about Joe Burrow it wasn't as much the X's and O's as it was his trust and confidence in his mm-hmm. teammates and yeah. in himself. And he said it himself as if, if I got a one-on-one coverage and the DB's head is it, it, and I see the back of a DB's head, I'm throwing it mm-hmm. in college football. Most coaches are most quarterbacks are not going to throw that football. If they <laughs> see tight coverage, they're looking to the next read. And yeah. to be honest, your lower, your lower tier quarterbacks in the National Football League, that's how they look at it in that league. If there's close to tight coverage, they're not going to throw the football. And so to me, it, we can talk X's and O's all we want to, and I'm not discrediting any of that when it comes to Joe Burrow. But his confidence, moxie, and, and, and trust in his guys to go make plays, to throw that football against tight coverage, that to me – is a separating factor from him than a lot of other guys. I'm not necessarily saying then to a, and, and to your point, Buck, I do like Justin Herbert and I don't think uh, he's, he's way out there either. I think there's some separation between him and the other two, but I, I don't think it's a very, very big gap uh, with Herbert. But to that point, I think that's where Joe Burrow to me has an edge is because he's got that desire and that ability and that confidence to try to make that throw. And then with Tua, I think the X factor for him, I love all of his tools. The thing I love the most, and Buck, you're going to love this, that boy left-handed. And I don't (laughs) care who you are as a defensive back because you don't see that many left-handed quarterbacks. They are difficult to deal with because they want to roll left as opposed to right. And when they start Mm -hmm. moving left and you try to come up and they pump that ball with the left hand, it is going to freeze you. And so, mm-hmm. to me, I think that's an added piece to Tua. And, and, and if you want to kind of split hairs, I've always said one of the things, and I'm not questioning his, great, his, his, his greatness, but I think one of the things that made Steve Young a little bit better than his talent was the fact that he's left-handed. 
because yeah. that's something you're not used to seeing, and it's difficult sometimes to defend. And, oh, by the way, for defenses, most offenses, right, are right-handed. You know, their, their standard pro set, the tight ends to the right, the flexes to the right, all those things are to the right. You get a left-handed quarterback, you can kind of flip that dynamic a little bit, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to defend. So I like that aspect of Tua's game. Yeah. So if, if we look at the first pick of the draft, Cincinnati, yeah. you got what, – what are the needs there? They need they need a quarterback. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I saw Cincy last year. The only – only place I saw them have an advantage against teams was the wide receiver position. They've got Auden Tate who can really ball. Uh, you've got Tyler Boyd, who I think is a real good player. Um, yep. I think and they AJ just healthy. Some help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you look at Geno Atkins on the D line. So basically to me, you're looking at O line, quarterback, maybe tight end. Yep. We'll talk about OJ Howard potentially there or Washington. So who, who does Cincinnati pick? Who do they take in the first with the first pick of the draft? I mean, I, I think it's I mean, I, I think it's gotta be Joe Burrow. And 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 here's why I say that. Um, you know, I just told you everything I love about Tua. But the also the, the added piece of this, this is still a business, man. And Joe yeah. Burrow just came off the most historic year in college football we've seen in a long time. He won a Heisman, he won a natty, so we know he's a winner, and he's from Ohio. Just put all the pieces together. They need to go ahead and accept they got to sell some tickets. Check, and, check, and, check. And, and, and all those are check marks. And you know what? The, the reality is, and I've been one of the people that said it the last three or four years, the last two years particularly, Andy Dalton's not the problem, but Andy Dalton's not the solution. Yeah. Joe Burrow is the beginning of the solution. That's the difference to me in why they got to go quarterback because, look, I like Andy Dalton, and, and look, they went to playoffs with Andy Dalton, and, and Marvin Lewis had them looking good with Andy Dalton, but they had the other pieces. Joe Burrow is the type of guy that you build around. Andy Dalton was a missing piece to all of the other pieces. Joe Burrow is the centerpiece. You go ahead and go get your centerpiece, and you work from there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just think that's – and look, we can say what we want. If you If you don't have – if your quarterback play is not in the top 12 of this league, top 15, now that they've had a couple of playoff teams, if you're not in the top 15 or 16 in terms of quarterback in this league, the top half of the league performance-wise, I don't care who that guy is. It could be it could be me playing quarterback, but if I'm playing at a top 10 level that year, we got a chance to win. If you don't have that consistently, you don't have a chance to win, which is why I think you got to go Joe Burrow because I'm not sure that I would say right now that Andy Dalton's one of the top – 10 or 12 quarterbacks in this league anymore three or four years ago maybe but right AK, now no AK, what, what, what are your thoughts AK I, I agree with the uh, Reg and you guys I mean Andy Dalton uh last year obviously without AJ Green I mean he, he was 16 16 touchdowns to 14 interceptions I mean it just looked like his play dropped off and I mean the line dropped off in front of him like I mean they, they struggled Acting. And I mean, that struggled Andy Dalton a lot. So, I mean, you need a guy that can kind of improvise and create plays for Zach Taylor in this offense. I mean, I agree with you all. And, you know, another thing is he spent money in free agency this year. He went out and signed guys like DJ Reader to pair with Geno Atkins on the interior. They're starting to get some young guys like Sam Hubbard getting going and trying to start along with Dunlap. I mean, you, you slowly start seeing the young guys start being pushed in there. And it's kind of – that's exactly what's happening is you bring in Joe Burrow and you're kind of trying to replenish the youth of this team and slowly start moving on from the older guys in probably about two, three years. I, he, here's the question with Washington to me, and I'll, I'm putting this out here to you guys. Um, AK, I'll start with you. It, it, can Dwayne Haskins be the answer at quarterback for the next 10 years? Oof. <laughs> and, and, and the reason I ask that is because that's also a new coaching staff and it people is. can say well they didn't draft him I don't think that's the piece of it it's when they look at him on tape last year do they think he can develop into the player that can lead this franchise for the next 10 years I, at I least eight that, I think so and, and that's why you take this guy at the top and uh problem is like they just didn't surround him with enough weapons they no. didn't him with the line and surround him with weapons. I mean, 
offensive that that is not you know i mean you're you're really relying on adrian peterson who's <laughs> eight years old that's really the blueprint of your offense i mean thank god terry mclaurin you know came in and took over i mean he's got a lot of respect right now from a lot of cornerbacks in the league and other than that i mean they really don't seem to have anybody else on offense that's really a threat and I mean, I can't blame the whole thing on Dwayne Haskins. I mean, it's pretty unfair that he's just getting trashed right now. <laughs> you know, I, he didn't even start all 16 games. I mean, he he was playing, then they took him out and playing. Like it just, it was just poorly handled by the last regime. And I mean, Ron Rivera is going to come in and obviously help this kid out. And I, I think you have to keep believing in this kid and keep surrounding him with players. I don't think you give up on this kid just yet. I think a healthy Darius Geis can help this football team too, Buck. What what are your thoughts on that? I, I think from the standpoint of this team, what you have is is a, a real good opportunity to go back to, to the basics. I mean, you know, I think they wanted they had a chance and they thought they had a real good shot at getting um, Greg Olson, who ended up going to Seattle. Uh, so they need tight end help. I think that's the one thing that if you're a young quarterback, you want to have a tight end. That's why I said O.J. Howard could be the X factor for Cincinnati. He could be the X factor for Washington. It looks like they're trying to trade him. Him and Bruce Arians have fallen out. And O.J. is one of those guys that wasn't a pure hand catcher in college. I think he really developed and played better. But if he, if this offense has a couple of tight ends and a quarterback that can play like Dwayne Haskins, get him some protection on the line, I think you're in a better better situation. Ron is going to play solid defense. That defense is going to be much better than what they were before. Offensively, I agree with you, Reg. When the weather gets bad in Washington, you got to be able to run the football effectively. Uh, and I think that's what they want to be able to do. And if Geis is healthy, that gives you a whole other dimension uh, with this offense to be a play action, throw the ball down the field. Because, you know, Haskins is not losing that arm. And no. you want to have – it's almost like a new version of the of the fun bunch when you had guys would, would pound you and uh, they would they would then go over the top of you. I think they want to have that kind of uh, modern day version of that if they can ever get the receiver play up to speed. And I think that's another thing. <clears throat> Question mark for me is: Do you add another high quality receiver in this year's draft? Because there's you can go twenty or thirty deep in the in the receiver position, and you're yeah. find a guy that I think will be. Yeah. 10 to 15 years and play at a, at a high level. So are you going with a guy that's a, a, a speed burner? going with somebody that's physical over the middle that Dwayne Haskins can use in that situation? So that's what I have for the men's. Here's my question. Um, would we, would, would, can we see this scenario playing out? Um, and I'm, I'm going to move past the first-round pick for a second. We'll come back to that. But let's just say the Redskins have two fourth-round picks. Do we think that's enough to get him – get O.J. Howard from Tampa Bay, number one, and then do you use the third round pick because this is a very deep receiver draft Do you use a third round pick or maybe do you try to create a trade with some picks from next year's draft to move into the second round to find a wide receiver and then add some pieces to help uh, Dwayne Haskins that way. Hey, Joe, I'll let you handle that one. What do you think? Oh man. I, I mean, does it, I think I the biggest key is does a, four get oj howard out of tampa i don't think yeah. so. i don't think a four does. you don't think a four does it i don't either i, don't I just threw does. it out there yeah i don't think a four does and i'm not i'm not really sure if tampa is actually gonna trade the guy because i mean just got there and with oj and cam break i mean that's one of a solid tight end duo right there on the inside i mean do they tom brady's known for tight end duos i'm gonna leave yeah. it right there <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I, I don't think I would do it. Uh, I, I think I keep building, and, I mean, really, they need to find – I mean, Tampa just needs a slot guy and a, and a reliable running back to go with Rojo. And, I mean, their offense is going to be fine. I mean, I don't, if I was them, I, w I would let Brady and O.J. Howard hash it out, and if they can't get going in camp, then, then I think you make the trade. But I think yeah. you give them a shot with Brady. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know if it's Brady. I think you know, Bruce Arians, when he makes a decision, just yep. like with Jack being gone, I, I don't. I don't think he OJ is in his plans. And now that he's not, 
And if Brady comes back and says, hey, I want Gronk, we're going to get part of that New England team together. I think they'll get – they look for a, 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 is a, is a third or fourth this year, but what about the next year? They're probably going to have to go into their pocket if you're Washington to get O.J. Howard because he was a former first-round pick. They're not going to just give him up for any for nothing. Uh, so I think that's going to be a real key right there. Yeah, well, the problem is because I would have I would have thought it's probably going to be a two or a three. They don't have a two this year, so without having a two, it's hard to give up a three as well. If you're the Redskins with all the deficiencies they have, and uh, so I, I just I just threw that out there. I think you know to me, uh, one of the other problems the Redskins had last year they didn't they didn't stop a whole lot of people. I mean, they looked like world beaters against the Carolina Panthers. I was at that game, and that, that was a dominant performance. Uh, but in general. Uh, this is a football team that has a lot of holes. And, and, and you mentioned, you know, the, the offensive line, holes. The defensive line, not great. The secondary, they just got rid of Josh Norman. They, now, they did bring in some other guys, and that defense is going to be solid with Ron. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see. And, 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 and I'll, I'll ask you guys first, uh, where do the Redskins go uh, with this number two overall pick? I think you go with Chase Young. You, you got to go with Chase Young right there. You, you don't pass up on the best player in the draft. I mean, you you keep adding on and hope that that line can build a little bit more consistency going into next year. And I mean, I, I just especially with Jack Del Rio being there. I mean, he likes to get the pressure from guys. I mean, I don't know how you can turn down yeah, Chase Young when he's right there. Yeah, it'd be hard to. I, I threw receiver position out just because I, you know, I, I think it's it's good to play with, but it's hard to pass up a Chase Young on a, on a defense with Payne and Jonathan Allen and Montez Sweat. Ryan Kerrigan also is a, is a really good player, but you increase your chances. It's hard to find a good edge rusher, and there's been some talk that Chase Chase Young is not that good. I will say this: he's going to make a difference on the defense, like you said, AK would. Uh, where you have a guy that wants to play defense and Jack Del Rio will find a way to get him on the field in different formations, different situations. So I'd have to say Chase Young at that second pick. The biggest thing that got me with Chase Young, because, like, when you look athletically, you're like, oh, man, like, it's like in that Miles Garrett type of level that we're talking <laughs> about. This guy's a freak, right? That's what we say. But there are plays that I see every year. This guy is a smart football player. This guy is a very – football player and that's an underrated aspect that people don't talk about with Chase Young everyone just says he's a freak but he's a very smart football player I mean when you when you get and the smarts I mean you, you can't turn that down if you're Washington you you got to take him because I know the team at number three is elevating to get him absolutely and uh, here here's my thought on it. I, I Chase Young is the answer to the riddle for me with the Washington Redskins here's why uh, whether it's uh, Payne up front, Ioannidis, who I think had eight and a half sacks last year, had a pretty good year for the Redskins. You need a double-digit sack guy, particularly in that division. You got a young quarterback like Daniel Jones on his way with a guy like Saquon Barkley as a, as a ultimate Swiss Army knife in that offense. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles, younger quarterback in Carson Wentz. Dak Prescott, if he stays with Dallas. These are younger quarterbacks that can move around the pocket. You better have somebody that can go get them. Maybe I'm biased because of Larry Johnson and the tutelage he's had with defensive linemen. You go back to both of the Bosa's. You go all the way back to Jimmy Kennedy and Michael Haynes at Penn State. Uh, I mean, you can continue to name the names that this guy's developed. Devin Still, uh, Tom Bahali, all these guys that he's developed. I think that's the other piece of it is you know Chase Young has been well coached. But I think here's the kicker. I think Chase Young is a guy that can play on either side of the defensive line. He can be a left end or a right end. Right now at 265 pounds, I think he can get up to 275, 280, and still be just as strong. If we look at him now, the guy's chiseled. He looks unbelievable in a uniform. Can you imagine this kid with an extra 10 to 15 pounds? I think he still is effective. Maybe not quite as fast, but I think he still is effective coming off the edge. He can play on both sides for you, and I think he's a guy that can be a consistent double-digit sack type of player uh, in a division that you're going to need somebody that can go get the quarterback. Hey, quick story on Larry Johnson. A few years ago, uh, I was at a, a function. You know, I asked him, hey, who are some surprise, up, upcoming guys that we don't know about, the names that we'll hear? Because, he had, you know, every year is somebody. It's all. 
you know, a, a bunch of guys that come out of there that are defensive ends. That, that, and he mentioned Chase Young. So I texted him a few weeks ago or about maybe two or three months ago and just said, I remember our conversation and he just laughed because he was – that they, they'd been so deep at Ohio State that he was playing, but he wasn't playing and he hadn't really shown up yet. But right. between that season, I guess he had had such a great off season that he was going to be ready to play and he showed up in a big way. And, and, and to that point, AK, I, I'm going to hit your point on the intelligence of Chase Young. I remember uh, as a Penn State guy when they played that – that big fourth down play with, with, with Trace McSorley his senior year, I think it was a fourth and five. And there was a couple of timeouts back and forth going into that play. And I'll never forget watching Chase Young because he was on the same side as the running back, right? They had the running back slid to his side and that zone read concept. And Chase Young had his hand in the dirt. And then they moved it back to the other side. Chase Young stood up, pointed to the other defensive end, that defensive end put his hand on the ground. Chase stood up on the play and made the play in the backfield on a loop stunt. And that told me everything I needed to know about his intelligence because he diagnosed what was coming and made that play two yards in the backfield. That's all I needed to know about Chase Young. That's, this is the biggest thing. Like, when you look at Montez Sweat from last year, he's got the speed and he's got the toughness, but the things are lacking. And I think that's the biggest thing is Chase can come in and take over on that right away and play over Sweat, and Sweat can just be a situational type of guy. That's the biggest thing I think happened last year was that's why Sweat fell to them like when they traded back up and tried to get him because I mean, Sweat's instincts were just all over the map. And you know, whether he was going to make the play, whether he was going to be on the other side, he just was not reliable. And especially with Jack coming in, I mean, you want guys that are reliable players that can play all the time. And Sweat's kind of right now just a situational type of guy. Yeah, I, I talked to a couple of uh, coaches last year going into the draft in the NFL, and, and that was the thing on Sweat was they were like, he, he seems to guess a lot. And when he guesses right, he looks great. Yeah. When he guesses wrong, he really does some unsound things to your defense that really puts you in a bind. So it's interesting you bring that up because that's something that I heard from coaches last year as well. What about the Lions? I mean, you know, you look at the Detroit Lions and what they – I was shocked that they let Darius Slay get away from them. Um, but I guess, you know, <laughs> Patricia is, is, you know, Belichick way in his approach. So I guess that wasn't going to work out. But you, you lose in a corner – in a division where teams like to throw the football and you're playing some, some high-quality quarterbacks. So cornerback is clearly a need. What other positions do you think with the Lions uh, that they'll look at from that standpoint? I think they need defensive line help as well. I mean, they don't get after the quarterback very well at all. Um, look, Stafford's put up numbers, but, I mean, can you name three wide receivers on that roster um, that are consistently making plays, or really two? Um, and I think that's another question. I think they've got to add weapons. Uh, the running game is okay. It's not great. Um, but we've seen – the big thing to me is we've seen Stafford deal with some injuries historically and deal with being beat up throughout the season. I don't know that you go offensive line at three because I don't know that anybody's grading that high. But I think that's a factor for this football team as well. They've got a lot of holes. I know for a lot of people – uh, Jeff Okuda is a, a pretty good answer here at defensive back position mm -hmm. after letting Slay go. But I think this is where the draft can get very, very interesting. And, and I think that goes back to AK's point where you might see some safe picks. I think the safe pick is Jeff Okuda here. Uh, but do the Lions go outside of the safe zone um, and really look outside the box and, and, and try to go get uh, some different type of different pick with outside of the cornerback slot because I think the other piece of it is if you go get Okuda do they have to admit to their fan base maybe we could have kept Slay and just paid him as opposed yeah. to going younger at the same position yeah I think, I think D line is also an area like you said that's a, a point to me that I would say for them outside of the corner, but do you give up on a cornerback that you didn't like and now you have a corner in Okuda who I think a lot of people think he's the top guy coming out, or do you go the defensive lineman like a Derrick Brown or Javon Kinlaw? 
I don't know if the – you know, some people may not think the D-line uh, pool is as deep. But they better watch film on, on Derrick yeah. Brown then. But that boy's a disruptor. <laughs> There's some really quality guys in that in that mix. And it'll be – I'm interested in Detroit's pick because I think it'll be defense. I don't think it'll be offense. Uh, but I really think that's going to be one of the things that uh, they have they have to improve as a team. Their offensive ranking wasn't as bad last year with Stafford. But I think defensively they didn't play very well in my opinion. I, this is a defense, and, and, and I'll get it right to you, AK. They had 28 sacks in 16 games. That's less than two sacks a game. That, that is awful in a league to where we see teams throw the football probably 60, 60 to 65% of the time. That's not going to get it done. No, I, I agree with you guys, and I mean – I think Bob Quinn's just sitting there and just saying there, there's a few players that are there that they're looking at. Obviously, Derek Brown, Okuda, Kinlaw, who technically fits that Patriots style better on defense because you can play him at like the crash end spot and then also slide him in. The thing that gets me is this. I think three right there. I think you have a stalemate right now at five and six between the Chargers and the Dolphins. Yep. Both of them are saying, I dare you to move up. I dare you to move up. And they're just kind yep. of holding out right there. I think the Chargers are going to be the team that jumps up there. And that way, the Lions can move down to six at minimum and come away with a quality football player such as Oda, Brown, or Kinlaw at one of those spots. And I agree with you guys. I mean, this team cannot sack the quarterback. And Trey Flowers is a really good – I mean, I'm not discounting anything that Trey does. Like, he's very reliable. Player, but he is getting double team on plays, and there is no one on the line that's a threat. I mean, I, those guys have to go out and get somebody to do that because they signed Trufant, and everything in that scheme is going to be all matchup-based. And you got a guy like um, Justin Coleman out there, and they just traded for Harmon. So it seems like everything, they're kind of going back to that New England style of matchup base. But the thing is, he wants to accumulate picks because he knows there are a lot of holes, and he has to fill those. Because you know, I, I look at that division, I, I see the Packers just running away with it again. <laughs> like, let's yeah, I, yeah. Let, it, it, it. Is Isaiah Simmons a guy that could fit in that mix if they end up at six just kind of hanging out and saying, whoever falls to us, whether it's Kinlaw, Brown, Simmons, Okuda, and we're going to get a pretty good football player and we've added some picks after trading? I think that's the biggest thing. That's exactly what they want to do. They just want to, they want to move down and try to accumulate picks and start getting quality football players because it's more than just one player that's going to come in and get those guys right away. I mean – like, if you add a Derrick Brown or Okuda, let's say they get Okuda, well, who's going to rush the passer, right? Who's going yeah, to rush the passer? Yeah, because Flowers and Kennard both last year had seven sacks. Kennard's a linebacker. Yeah, and <laughs> Kennard, they, they cut Kennard after that. Like, right. They, I mean, they brought in Jamie Collins. Really, I think they're going to use Jamie more as a rusher than they are as an actual linebacker. I don't know if I'd do that, but yeah. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, they're in <laughs> deep trouble because they got nobody else that can rush the passer. So, if I'm them, I do whatever I can to move down. And I feel like it's going to be the Chargers at the end of the day that are kind of just laying low, just being quiet, and then kind of saying, man, like, if they're – I think those are the guys that are in extreme love with Justin Herbert, and they've kind of just kept it – on wraps because he's already a West Coast guy. They feel like he can come in, kind of fit into that system, and then take over after Tyrod Taylor finishes out over there. So, guys, next, um, you know, we go to pick number four, and I, I think this is this is another one. I, I, I said for years Eli Manning wasn't the only problem with the with, – well, I didn't think he was the problem with, with the Giants. Um, they pick up Saquon, then they, they surprise everybody with Daniel Jones. What do they do at number four in 2020? Offensive line. If they don't go offensive line, I'm gonna hurt Gettleman. He yes. likes something. You better go O line. I don't. They can tell me everything they want to, but until they protect those guys, 
both Jones and Saquon Barkley, that offensive line has been awful for a couple of years. They need to improve that offensive line, in, in my opinion. Exactly agree with Buck right there, too. It's <laughs> I mean, you got to look at Jedrick Willis, uh, Andrew Thomas, you know, Beckton, uh, yep. from Iowa. I'm looking through all of the names at offensive line and whichever one they've circled <laughs> and, and mainly tackle, but yes. whoever they circle as an offensive lineman. Because it, let, let's say this, I, I will say this too. Think about Quentin McDonald a few years ago when everybody was saying, why would you pick a guard that high? I don't know if there's any guards like that this year. No, and I told people in Indianapolis when I would be when I do interviews because I watched him in college. I said, "You're getting a guy that's a dog, and he's going to years, and he's going to help your offensive line." I think the biggest thing is you gotta um, you gotta do a good job. Yeah, Quentin Nelson, excuse me. You gotta do a nice job of offensive line uh, built for this team because you gotta get. A lot of young players, and that, that's the area to me that they have struggled with over the last few years. you got to protect your asset. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yep. I mean, Eli Manning's career was cut short and, and, and ushered in the era of Daniel Jones because they couldn't keep Eli upright because they wouldn't protect him. Uh, Saquon Barkley is a, is a ridiculous player. But if you can never hand him the football, what's the point if there's no hole? you got to find an offensive line. And, and let me ask you this, AK. Offensive line not as deep as quarterback and wide receiver in this draft. Are they a candidate to maybe trade back, get some additional picks, and still get the offensive lineman they want? I think so. I think, I think they got, obviously, the three guys circled over there between um, Andrew Thomas, uh, Jedrick Willis, and Tristan Wirfs, those three. And then, I mean, Becton's kind of – he's a freak. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Becton is unbelievable, and that's the biggest thing. They need a right tackle, and Becton has switched sides. And, I mean, if they can still drop down, accumulate more picks, and get one of those guys, I think they'll walk away very, very happy. But yeah. I, I think the Isaiah Simmons rumors are just kind of just floating out there. I, I don't think it's – yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. It, it, I agree with you all. Like, it's going to be a tackle. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, and I, I think the cornerstone, again, let me go back to Quentin Nelson. I, I think I might have butchered his name because I was thinking about it. And Ant Anthony C Costanzo. Costanzo. Yeah, those are the two with the Colts on the left side. I think you need the same thing if you're the Giants. You need some stability on that offensive line, and you've got to start with, with whoever you pick. They better – they have to be a 12-year guy. I don't think yeah. you can, you can uh, have a – a miss at the offensive line position this year if you're the New York Giants. No, I totally agree. I think they go offensive line as well. And then uh, let's let's try to round out the top five. The Miami Dolphins, an accumulation of picks, uh, a massive amount of, of talent overhaul over the last couple of years. Uh, we've heard the rumors of Tua at quarterback, and, and there's so many pieces for this football team that they could go. Do they go Tua here? And is Tua still there? Or did, has someone traded up to get to him? I, I feel like Tua will, will be there. I feel like someone will trade up to get Herbert before somebody trades up to get Tua. Wow. Yeah. wow. So, hey, you don't sound excited about it, though. You don't sound super no. excited about it. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> this year, this he, year. He's making it seem like, well, it's just routine. It's what it should be. <laughs> It's just the thing is this year, if if they do take Tua, and the only people that really know who they're gonna take are GM Chris Career, head coach Brian Flores, and owner <laughs> Ross, who will probably find two days before the draft. Right. <laughs> officially come up. And I still think they're still discussing all possibilities. I mean, they're not officially saying like, hey, we're all in on Herbert or hey, we're all in on Tua. Like they're they're kind of even keeled right now, doing their doing their process. And they're going to talk it over, and Brian Flores is going to be the guy that ultimately makes that call, whether to go with yeah. Tua or Herbert. And if it's if it's Tua, this next year is not going to be all right. We're going to push Tua in or any no. It's going to be a fight between Fitzpatrick and Josh Rosen, and give that's what that's what I was going to ask you. Yes, I mean, I, Josh. You know, watching him in college, I really thought he was going to have a chance. I know there's a lot of talk about him having you know, attitude, blah, blah, blah. But the kid had 
next level talent. I think when he went to Arizona, that was not good for his psyche. And now being in, in a situation with Fitzpatrick or Fitzmagic is making things happen and it's hard for him to get on the field. What about Josh Rosen before we even think about the, the draft of quarterback this year? I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought him up, Buck, because that conversation bothers me when people kind of come after his personality. And, and, and the one that I'm quickly reminded of that I throw in people's face, Jay Cutler was a prick, too. And everybody let that – and he still is. <laughs> and everybody let that go for years. And, and they made excuses for – oh, but the arm talent this, and he's got such a strong – Hey, I will They'll say this about Jay. He could play. He yeah, could he could play. play. Yeah. He could play. And I think once Rosen got a little bit of negative buzz going into that draft, I think some people, some GMs and coaches buried him before they even figured out if this kid could play. And, and the reality is I don't know that he's had a legitimate chance. And this is a bad comparison, but I'm going to use this as a metaphor anyway. And I said this at the time. It's all about how you handle a young quarterback. I thought the way the Chargers in particular handled Ryan Leaf, because remember when Ryan Leaf went to the Chargers, they had Harbaugh, and they said, Ryan Leaf's the future, we're not going to play him yet, and then they played him because Harbaugh got hurt, and they said, we're going to ride it out. Harbaugh comes back healthy, but they're still going with Ryan Leaf. He throws one pick in the game where Harbaugh's healthy again, and they go back to Harbaugh, and they mishandled him the entire time, and he torpedoed. Now, there are some other things that you can add to that that became more – Yeah, I was going to say Ryan Leaf had a lot more issues. He did. But Josh Rosen, from the handling of how they're going to develop him as a player, it mirrors what happened with Ryan Leaf, and it scares me. And and I just wonder if this kid's ever going to get a legitimate shot to prove that he can play in the NFL. And I think that's what this year is all about, is trying to see if Josh can take that next step with better pieces around him, especially on the line. It's can he take that next step up? Because last year, I mean, we played with a historically bad offensive line. Like, yeah. no matter who it is, they were going to die back there. Like, yeah. it's magic at least had toughness. <laughs> I mean, would just throw the ball up as high as right. he can to say, all right, DeMonte, just go get it. But I, I think that's the thing. Like, once you keep on getting hit, Rosen's kind of start going down. I mean, no one likes getting hit. And young quarterbacks, they start looking down. I don't know why. I mean, it seems like Fitz likes getting hit for some odd reason. (laughs) But I think that's the thing is you got to give Rosen a fair shot again and let him and Fitz fight it out to be the starter and let Tua kind of just keep learning under Chan Gailey. Uh, Next year, you'll be between one of those guys. Between Hopefully Rosen can step up and we'll be between the young guy they take this year and Josh Rosen, I think, next year. I got I no the, problem with Tua being a redshirt candidate. Yeah. I, I think one other thing, guys, the running game, I think, you know, you and I talked about that a little bit, AK, with them picking up Jordan Howard. The average, I think, less than two yards a carry last Oof. year. They didn't yes. run, the, you know, run the ball very effectively last year. So no, I look at some of these agency pickups that would help, and that would be one to me that would help any quarterback, whether it's Josh, whether it's uh, Fitzpatrick, or even – if Tua were fortunate enough to get drafted and then early. Exactly. So we were shocked when Kenyon Drake got traded. We're like, oh, no. Like, yeah, that one, that one surprised me, too, because I thought Kenyon Drake was, was really uh, becoming a really good player for the Miami Dolphins offense, making a lot of plays. Now, he did have some fumbling issues at times. We'll put the football on the ground in some big situations. But I still thought that he was turning into a really good player for them. So that, that trade uh, did throw me off a little bit as well. I didn't see that one coming well, we've talked about the first five uh, teams that'll be picking to start the, the draft on Thursday night and uh, it'll be interesting to see what becomes of the rest of the first round and and for that uh, we'll give you that but on the other side so we're going to take a short break and then we'll be back with the rest uh, of the first round in the 2020 NFL draft from our minds uh, so we'll be right back I got to go a full time out. Yeah. All I got to say is, is it football TV yet? This stuff is too good to pass up. There's so many things that have to go right in a no hitter. A huge game changer. I would have won the Powerball like six times. <laughs> Kevin Casey here, and this is your podcast talking about sports, the Carolina's own sports talk show. We're talking about sports on AM. 
<laughs> We're talking about sports at ADSN. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. We're talking about... <laughs> We're talking about sports in... Oh, God, I forgot. ADSN. What is it? ADSN. ADSN, okay. Yep. Yeah. We're talking about sports. Talking about sports. We're talking about sports. Talking sports. We're talking about sports. We're talking about sports on ADSN. Talking about sports on ADSN. <laughs> <laughs>
the NFL season will start on time or there may be a delay, but if there is an issue with social distancing and we still have to have games played without fans, that stadium is going to be a place that people want to go and see. And if the Chargers are only getting 20,000, I'm not saying a quarterback is going to make the difference, but you've got to have some marquee power in L.A. Having gone to school there, having played there, you've got to have something for those fans, especially when you're not a team like the Raiders that used to be there or the Rams who have more cachet and more fans in the L.A. area to me than San Diego. Uh, the, see, I want to say it again. The there, there, yep. <laughs> I, 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 trust me, I feel your pain. I, 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 I just think this is – the Chargers have a chance to really – I mean, I know we talked about – uh, what could happen with Detroit at three, but the Chargers have a chance to maybe turn this draft on its head um, by either going up or moving back, um, depending on what they decide to do. Now, if they stand pat, that's one thing. But if they go up or back, they could turn this draft on its head. And I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, what the L.A. Chargers uh, end up doing. question is, do you guys think Jordan Love is in play here? With at Tyron? six – I don't see that at six. I Look, I wasn't that upset with Gettleman when he jumped up there to take Daniel Jones at that spot. And some people were like, that's too high. You could have got him. Low. If you love a guy, go get the guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if the Chargers love Jordan Love like that, just pick him at six. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, 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 because, and he's going to be there. Yeah. So yeah. I, there, there shouldn't even be any conversation coming out of their camp because they know their guy's going to be there at six. Yep. So the reality to me is, again, they have a chance to turn it on its head. Trading back for love, turn it on its head. Trade up for Herbert or Tua, turn it on its head. Sit pat and take love at six still turns the draft on its head. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, so... Yeah, I really yeah. Panthers? Yeah, so, so Buck, <laughs> you and I both live in the Charlotte area. Yeah. Uh, the Carolina Panthers. Um, they go get – they go – they release Cam Newton, who's been the face of the franchise for a decade, uh, former Super Bowl uh, participant, league MVP. They give Teddy Bridgewater $60 million uh, to come in here and be the new quarterback. I think this is a very, very interesting – I think they're going to go defense uh, with this pick. Um, but I think the interesting piece is this pick could tell us what Matt Rule wants to do defensively in terms of 4-3 or 3-4. Because I think if they go with a defensive lineman up front, particularly an in, in interior guy uh, like a Brown or Kinlaw, I think that tells us they want to go back to more of a 4-3 style – and, and have two really good tackles inside, two good inside players uh, with, with K-1 Short coming off an injury. But then on the flip side, I think if, if a guy like Isaiah Simmons is the name that comes off the board, I think we may see some more 3-4 out of this defense. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I, I, I'm interested because I think they're going to go interior. They need a three technique. Even yep. if they stay at a 3-4 at a or they – more back into the 4-3, they're going to be a multiple defense. Mm -hmm. Phil Snow, who's their defensive coordinator, even though he's been in college a long time, I think they'll have an adaptable defense. They'll have to. But when you have a guy like Derrick Brown, he's a pick that you say we got to go after. The only difference is do you want an athlete in Isaiah Simmons? Because Shaq Thompson was very similar. Shaq was a very versatile linebacker coming out of the University of Washington. He's turned into a really nice player at the linebacker position. Brian Burns is still a edge guy to use him in, you know, in, in this defense that they had last year. He, he did a really nice job uh, learning how to play the position. But I think if you draft an Isaiah Simmons, you've got another versatile, athletic, lengthy guy who's maybe not physical at the attack, so you put him on the backside. You let him learn how to play the position of linebacker completely as opposed to moving him all around, but he has some versatility. So I think those two guys, Isaiah Simmons and uh, Derek Brown, and maybe Ken Law, that's out of third, would be the, the way I, I could see the Panthers going. Great pickup to me with Robbie Anderson because yes. he has an understanding of this offense and he's and worked with water and he can run. He, he is a guy that can burn 
and he's going to add more dimensions to this offense. Yeah, AK, uh, to that point, defensively again, I, I, let me throw this out there at, at you. Um, let's just say the pick is Isaiah Simmons, right? Now all of a sudden you've got Whitehead who came over from the Raiders. I don't care who anybody, who, what anybody thinks. If you're the leading tackler on a team in the National Football League, you're probably a pretty good football player. Yeah. So you add Whitehead with Shaq Thompson, all of a sudden let's say you go get Isaiah Simmons and you still have Brian Burns. If you want to play a 3-4, you can play some games on the edges with Brian Burns as well. Uh, how difficult would it be to deal with that kind of defense, to your point, Buck? Uh, but, but asking you, AK, the multiplicity of, of, that, of that defense. I think it would be very difficult. And, I mean, they, they got to rush the passer. I mean, you just got Brady in the division. You got Breeze. I mean, Matt Ryan. Yeah. I mean, they got to get pressure on the quarterback. But whichever guy this is, no – the way Matt Rule is, it's going to be a high character football player. Yep. Which is why I personally feel like with the money they invested in Shaq, I, I, I really feel like it's going to be Derek Brown at this. Mm. I think it's really going to be Derek Brown. And I mean, they brought Steven Weatherly over from Minnesota. And like you guys said, I, I think this is going to be more of a 4 3 type of look. And in this day and age, I mean, everything's really sub down situations anyway so right. yeah i think yeah. burns on the field more weatherly can place that strong side and then bump inside if need be but i mean Derek brown's a game changer and how long is cable on short really going to be there i agree are we yeah. thinking like three years or are we thinking more like year to year basis with short i think he's closer to year to year remember he's already had his second contract he's in his second contract um so i think that's going to be an interesting piece and I also think, to your point, you know, you can play some different – do some different things with Burns as well, and, and they got to get after the quarterback. And, and, and right now, I, 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 for me, uh, I, people have asked me what I think of Derrick Brown, and I describe him in one word, disruption, period. That is what he does consistently along that defensive front is disrupt everything you're trying to do. Yeah. This Panthers defense. They, they weren't bad last year at getting after the quarterback. No. You know, defensively, they're actually, if you look at their defensive rankings, they were decent, not great. But the one thing they did well was get after the quarterback. And I agree with you, the interior pressure and being able to be solid against the run, I think is going to be really critical for this team moving forward because you've got some quarterbacks now that can – really play, but they're going to have run games and you're going to have to force them in the third and long. And even if you do that, whether it's Brady, who, who we know can't move quite like he could in the past, he's still a, a very efficient quarterback. I think the, the key for me, though, is, you know, how do you stop the run and really win on first and second down and force these teams in the third and long that you're playing, whether it's New Orleans, Atlanta, or uh, New England. And, and I think that's you know, a three technique like that who is not just a, a, a regular three but can just run like nobody's business, that's going to be key for this Panthers team, I think, if you look at how their shape uh, how it shapes up. Yeah, I mean, that guy is a walking third and long situation creator <laughs> if I've seen one in the last four or five years. Uh, so let's jump down to, to number eight, the Arizona Cardinals now. I think this is a very, very interesting thing. This was an offense that was a top 15 uh, offensive efficiency, Kyler Murray growing as a player, still have Larry Fitzgerald there, but now Nuke, DeAndre Nuke Hopkins being a part of this offense, and you start looking around and you go, if they can just figure out how to keep giving it back to this offense, look out for this football team. So to me, I expect them to potentially go defense uh, with this pick. What do you guys expect? Hey, all I'll say is you just if you're Arizona or anybody, you're just hoping that you can make a trade with Bill O'Brien. <laughs> oh, I'm call he's on my phone right now. <laughs> he's on everybody's short list to say, uh, do you want to unload anybody? Can we take advantage of you in this situation? I know they end up picking up Brandon Cooks, and I think Cooks is a, a really good player. But DeAndre Hopkins, uh, talking about Houston now, is is younger, has not had the concussion problems, and with Christian Kirk. Larry Fitzgerald, you know this, this offense is going to score. They scored last year. That wasn't the issue. So, Reg, I agree with you. Defensively, 
their offensive ranking, you knew with this air raid that had some uh, power run game principles, they were going to be good. They were uh, 13th in offensive efficiency last year. So this offense is going to get better. It's defense that they need. Their defense was awful at times last year, and I think that's the uh, – they have to find some playmakers on the defense to make them better and get that offense to ball a little bit more. Absolutely agree with you guys. I think it's I think it's definitely going to be defense that they're thinking about, and you guys have a right tackle projected there. But in this offense with Kyler's ability to move, you really just need like a position and seal guy. You don't really need like a stout right tackle. So I, I definitely think they go defense. I mean, Chandler is still playing at an unbelievable level. He was almost that NFL sack leader. He, he lost it by point five to Shaq Barrett last year. You know, still <laughs> dynamic, but. Interior Jack Barrett wise, ate off the Panthers last year. Oh, man. But interior-wise, like, they signed Jordan Phillips, which was a great move. And with Vance Jones being there formerly, they knew each other. And Jordan had a great season last year with Buffalo. And so they improved the interior right there. But overall, I mean, they need to keep on improving this whole defense. I mean, Jordan, <laughs> Jordan Hicks cleaned up so much back there for them last year. And, I mean, I, I could yeah. – yeah. They, they could do a bunch of things here, guys. I, they could even, I personally think, even start considering a corner also to go opposite of E2. You got yeah. Aaron Murphy and um, Buddha Baker that can play the slot, but right. who's really the other outside corner, right, next to E2? And yeah. now you start thinking you bring Hop, but the reason Bill O'Brien traded Hop was the contract because – Tunsil, the highest paid tackle. Yep. Are you going to pay DeAndre Hopkins, the highest paid receiver? And then you got to start paying Deshaun Watson. So that was the issue there. So he's planning ahead, like, I can't do this, so I need to just move. Yeah, yeah. Are expendable. That's what he said. Now, in Arizona's situation, Fitz is on a year-to-year basis. Now you're going to pay Hop. problem is, you pay Hop. Now you're, they're talking about paying Kenyon Drake. He, too, wants a contract, too. <laughs> he wants a contract. Yeah. Now you got to increase that. The, just a year later, are you going to re-sign Buddha Baker? That's another thing. So they're going to start yeah. decisions start coming up for time, and I don't know. I mean, it's just really going to come down to it. Buddha Baker is going to be cheaper. He's more versatile. Or you <laughs> sign Patrick Peterson back up and just. AK, I'm, I'm glad you said that about Buda Baker because I talked about this defense not being good, but he was the one consistent guy. I mean, Patrick Peterson, we know. He's, he's, he's established himself as a guy that can make plays. I think Corey Peters is there now, too. Yep. Um, unsigned. Yep. You know, he was a free agent, one of their free agent pickups, which is a good thing for them. But I agree with Buda Baker, the versatility that he showed not only in college, but as a young player in this league, I think he's got a real good opportunity He and Taylor Rapp, to me, are those two young safeties, Taylor Rapp at the Los Angeles Rams that I'm kind of looking for. And they're both Washington guys, but I'm just kind of keeping an eye on because they are both – that UW defense a few years ago I don't think gets enough credit, and we're starting to see some some of these guys now. Starting with Shaq Thompson a few years ago, and then after that, these young – Buda Baker and Taylor Rapp, if you don't know who they are, take a look at them. Two really – yeah. Two guys in the NFC that are going to be players for a long time, I think. Let let me give you guys three names. (laughs) Buck, you know where I'm going here. Russell Wilson, Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo. You better figure out how to either put them on the ground or confuse them. If you take away Jones last year, this is a team that had 21 sacks. That's awful. Terrible. They only had seven interceptions as a team. They have to find a way to make some plays on defense and put some teams in some difficult situations because we know their offense is going to be explosive. I think they have to go defense here. I tell you what, I don't think Okuda is going to be there, but I tell you what, man, if a guy like Okuda slips to here, they have a developing situation, if you understand (laughs) what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I'm sure that their draft room is saying that. If there's any way Okuda slips down to us, I don't think there's any question that they take him. Oh, uh, he's got to fly off the board. Absolutely. <laughs> that's one of those. That's one of those Mike Tice race to the podium. Like you yeah. can't get to pick in fast enough. Like, yeah. oh, the other team's done here. We're done here. Yeah. 
Just yeah. announce him back to back, uh, Roger. He'll, he'll be. He would be texting Goodell, Goodell early, like, "Hey, I got my pick." <laughs> yeah, because I mean that, that. I mean that's a that's an absolute no brainer pick. You know, if he's there, I mean, yeah, because the Panthers aren't going well, defensive back. Uh, and think think about the DC, Vance Joseph, right? A defensive back guy. That yeah, that that goes right into his wheelhouse. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to see if if, if that would if he would have slipped down Jeff Okuda to that to the Arizona Cardinals, that would be a real good pickup for them. That'd be a, they would they would have won the draft just with that one pick. Oh, they'd be doing backflips out there. They would be absolutely doing backflips out there. Uh, jumping, jumping down to nine, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, this is a football team that they were just bad last year. Uh, Leonard Fournette. Uh, and that running game, they, they've got to do. They've got to get better there in terms of the offensive line, I think, as well. Um, they, they say they're going to go with Gardner Minshew. Uh, this is an interesting team, and I, I tell you, they, they lose Calais Campbell uh, on that defensive front as well. I, I have no idea what they're going to do. I have no clue. Yeah. Rich, Rich, can I say something too? The culture seems to be in flux down. Yes. I don't know consistently what's happening with them. The guys have wanted to get out of there, whether it was Jalen Ramsey, um, you know, you talk about Calais Campbell. There, there's just been a – there's been some things going on there that, that you can't quite put your, your finger on. The one consistent they've had, and I think Miles Jacks has still played well for them, they've got to figure out a way to – all that outside noise, get back to what they were doing before. And they've got some weapons on offense. They've got some guys that can play on defense. It just – I don't know the culture. I don't know who, you know, is Leonard Fournette a leader or is he one of those? It's not a cult, it's not a good culture guy. I don't know. I, yeah. Accusing him, I'm just saying they have had some issues the last couple of years after playing so well. We thought this was a team that was going to be consistently in the playoffs and it hadn't happened for him. So Doug Marone's got a lot of things to do with this culture. Bringing Jay Gruden. Um, he's the offensive coordinator. I'm not real high on Jay as a head coach, maybe he's an offensive coordinator, but it's going to be interesting to watch this team, not just the draft, but they come out of this because they're not able right now to build this culture that they want to get. And that has been in, I thought they were right at the point of turning the corner. Of AK, your thoughts? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you all. I mean, I, I grew up in Jacksonville, and, I mean, this one, <laughs> this one, I mean, three years ago, you're right there knocking on the doorsteps to go to the Super Bowl, and he's like, see Ramsey, Nagakwe, Campbell. I mean, Campbell trade, that was the one that shocked me a lot because this came out and said, this is a win-now mode, technically. Like, you yeah. got to have this one last season why would you get rid of a high culture guy like Calais Campbell? Yeah, exactly. When, that's, that's what exactly. I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> like he did not want to be moved. Like he, he himself was shocked. He, now, he, wanted to be, he wanted to retire. Jack. He wanted to retire. Exactly. Jack War. And like that. They let Allen Robinson go a few years ago as well. And like, I, don't, I don't know what they're doing. It's just, you know, it's a team that's actually done pretty decent in the draft. They've drafted guys like Ramsey, you know, Robinson mm -hmm. types of guys, but they've done a bad job managing them. They've done yes. a very bad job from a managerial standpoint. And whether it was Tom Coughlin, they blamed it on him. Now Codwell's under fire. So it's just the owner has been very patient. That I give him that. He has been very patient. I don't when know normal how. owners would have not been like this. <laughs> so Nagakwe was the latest guy that said, I want out. I want to go to a winning culture. He's the guy that came out and mm -hmm. asked them on Twitter. Like, he completely blasted yeah. him. They have to move him, but they want to get a first-round pick back for a pretty good pass rusher. The problem is I don't see anybody giving them a first-round pick for that guy, and he also wants to be like a top pass rusher. So yeah. no team's willing to do that right now, and that guy is the biggest reason that we're the Jaguars culture right now because every day, every night, he says, can someone trade me, please? Can someone please get me out? <laughs> um, repeating it over and over and I mean I like I like the little Minshew mania it's cool like for fans they sell t-shirts I mean everyone's wearing a mustache I mean it's awesome right it's, it's cool to see but at the end of the day I mean these guys fell off defensively fell off big time defensively and losing Calais 
Miles Jack got a top three contract level last year, but they expected him. They always knew he was talented. Don't get me wrong. Everyone knew how talented this kid was. He never stepped up as a leader. And that's why they went out and signed Joe Schobert, inside linebacker and a great leader on the field. So it's interesting. Your two big guys on, on this team, like Minshew, we, we know it's all the, the rage. Everybody, you know, jokes about him and his jorts and all of that good stuff. But I think Leonard Fournette and Miles Jack have to be leaders for this team. Absolutely. So whoever you bring yes. in the fold, we can, we can, I mean, there's a bunch of things they need to happen, but those two guys to me have to be the difference makers because they're your guys. I, I think Mark, is, is, is another – DJ Chark, they've got some some folks on the offensive side that can make plays. D.D. Westbrook Absolutely. here. Yep. There are two key guys to be the cornerstones to get this culture turned around. And if Doug Marone isn't with them, on them with Zoom and talking to them every day and sending them leadership books, he better be. Absolutely. And, I mean, I, like losing – out on Ramsey and Boye, like that, that's huge. I mean, this was talked about as the number one pass defense three years. They have right now DJ Hayden and Rashawn Melvin as their starting corners going in to day one. They will definitely be, if they draft for need at nine, they will take a corner, and which would be CJ Henderson right up the road. But I think Cod will take best player available, whoever that is. So whoever they have highest on the board, whether it's a Kinlaw, I, I'm not sure. He, he does a good job of keeping stuff inside that organization. But Josh Allen came off yeah. 10 and a half sacks last year and just took off. I mean, he, he looked absolutely unstoppable. Everyone raved about Nick Bosa, but this guy was quiet because he was on a losing team. But consistently pressured, consistent sacks. This guy's a good player. Cleveland? So, so – I have no idea what they're going to do. So, so guys, I, I think one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's why we talk so much more about the culture. But I, I, I think let's, let's let's look at the Cleveland Browns. Let's yep. take a look at the Cleveland Browns. And AK, I want to get your thoughts on on this ball club uh, because I'm really interested. At the ten spot, there have been some times where ten can turn your program around, or then you can make a bad choice, Baker. Feel? Has he matured enough? Uh, has is Odell back completely happy there? It seems like he is. And Jarvis Landry, you know, homeboys from way back. Uh, Miles Garrett, uh, you know, what is going to what is going to become him after all the stuff that happened last year? Now, I'm curious about what you think from the standpoint of this team and what they do in the draft. AK. I mean, John Dorsey, the former GM, put together a very talented personnel team do a good job building an actual team. He collected a lot of talent, but never really built a team. And then Baker went from 14 interceptions the first season to 21 this past year. So the biggest thing that I saw in Baker was when he's comfortable, he'll thread the needle of these guys. Yes. He just was not comfortable and out and pay Jack Conklin money. And I think Jack Conklin's an average starter, but a good job thing is, you have to get a franchise left tackle at that spot. And I feel like that's one of the spots where Miami could try and jump up and get their tackle. If Cleveland is willing to move down, I think Miami could try and use some picks to jump up and get a guy like Willis or Andrew Thomas at 10 in front of the Jets. But if I'm Cleveland and I really want to care about Baker Mayfield, I may protect him. And that running game was outstanding last year with Nick Chubb. I mean, Nick Chubb was unstoppable. That's where they need to get back to, and that's what Stefanski will start doing again. But they need to protect Baker whenever they want to take shots. And, I mean, I don't know how you pass up one of those four tackles at that spot, whichever one is there. I think that's interesting you say that. I, I'm not sure that they're going to go tackle at 10. I think it would be the right move. But something just tells me they may not go there. I, I, I think there's a couple of pieces here, and, I, and I'm concerned that they may look to 
try to add to that pass rushing game with Miles Garrett, and we could see somebody come off the board uh, that's more of an edge rusher, um, and you could see multiple things. I think Caleb on Chase on it would be too high to go get him. Uh, we've talked about Ken Law and the fact that he may be still available there. So I think those are factors as well. But I agree with you. I think the pick should be offensive line. I just feel like it's not going to be with the, with the Cleveland Browns. Hey, and guys, I think it's – yeah, here, here's one thing I think, too, and it just kind of dawned on me. Denzel Ward is established at the cornerback position, Greedy Williams on the other side, right? I think they go safety. Grant Delpit? Yeah, LSU, yeah. <laughs> I am yeah. sure Jarvis and OBJ are in that ear. So yeah. <laughs> and, and it's because Delpit gives you some versatility. I know there's been some knocks on him. I like Delpit. I, think I do, too. Good pro. I know you got, you know, some guys back there, Carl Joseph, Sendejo is a, a pickup from Minnesota, but I don't think you hurt yourself by drafting a, a, a guy that can fill, but also can help you in some slot, come down in the box just a little bit, not a lot, but he's not afraid to tackle from the safety position. And what about Isaiah Simmons at this spot? I t- Ooh. <laughs> that's a, that that's both, a, that's a, as well as add pass rush, and you just lost Joe. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, because he gives you – and he Isaiah gives you a little bit of that Dayon Buchanan mold where he can be a big safety for you. He can play in the slot a little bit, but he can be a small linebacker that creates some problems around the line of scrimmage too. So I, I think that's a very interesting observation. I think if Simmons is there, it wouldn't surprise me if he comes off the board. But I'm with you all. I still think it should be offensive yeah. line here. Yeah. And Mac Wilson came on last year too a little bit. I mean, they, they were shocked that, you know, that he came on. <laughs> So, at least that's encouraging to see. Yeah, so, guys, I mean, that's, that's, that's the top ten of the draft. Um, uh, just going to throw this out here real quick. What's a name, you know, that we didn't talk about, you know, in this top ten that, that you think could be a big-time player? And we, and we talked about the depth of wide receiver. Really didn't talk about any of these guys coming off the board. What are maybe, what's maybe that one name you think we should all look out for uh, that could have a really strong rookie season? AK, I'll let you go first. Um, I mean, Jerry Judy, man. I mean, <laughs> mm. You're going high. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's going high. <laughs> hey, hey, I got one I got one for you. That's an obvious one. I think he's going to be really good. Keep an eye on Denzel Mims out of Ooh, Baylor. Okay. I like Denzel. I mean, because when I looked at these, LaVisca Chenault is another one that you, you have to say has a chance to be special. But – um, Jalen Rager from TCU, but I like Denzel Mims. I am the more I watch tape on him, the more I see a guy that has it. He's raw, he doesn't do everything well. Dude, he's a dog, he competes, and that's what I love about this group of receivers the ability to compete, in the pass, but also you watch him in the run game. I like to see guys that get after it, and I'm seeing some of that from some of these guys. Pittman is another one from that's USC. Cool. But yeah, it's it's a couple of those receivers, Reds, that I get excited talking about because I think they got they got a chance to be pretty good. Buck, I'm mad at you because you mentioned both of my guys. I like Lavishka <laughs> Chenault if he can stay healthy. He's had a lot of injury issues at Colorado, yeah. but the guy for me is Michael Pittman Jr. Six yeah. four and some chains, two hundred thirty pounds. He just he plays really really strong, but he's faster than you think. Reminds me a little bit of 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 guys like Mike Evans. Remember Vincent Jackson, those big physical yeah. receivers that can really make some plays once they catch the football. So I say those that those two names for me are are, are a couple of couple of names to keep an eye on. And and then one, go ahead, but one last one before I have to head out, get out of here. Colin Johnson out of UT. Yes, I, I I think Colin has to continue to play big. When he plays big, it's awful hard to to, to defend him. They, they got some big receivers coming out this year. T. Higgins, but Colin Johnston is one I think you need to keep an eye out for as well. I agree. I agree. I, that's a that's a good call on that one, Buck. So, look, we've talked about the top ten. We've talked about some wide receivers that may jump off the board for you. Uh, but that's just our opinion. That's our thoughts on uh, the top ten of this draft in 2020. And uh, for, for first of all, Buck, appreciate your time. AKA man, it's been great working with you. Appreciate your time as well. And uh, look, man, we. We had to chop it up. We had to break down this 2020 draft, and uh, we'll be back, I'm sure, sometime after the draft to give you guys uh, our opinions on what teams did because we talked about so many different picks. 
But for now, for AK and for Buck, Reggie Walker, this has been Talking About Sports 2020 NFL Draft Preview Special. Thanks for watching. Y'all have a good one.